The passage today that we're reading is the beginning of one of Paul's happiest letters that he wrote to the Church of Philippi. Letters, also known as epistles, are written by apostles to the different early churches to address issues within the church, to encourage them, and to teach them. In the New Testament, apart from the Gospels, is by and large a collection of letters that have been written to another church. And in Philippians 1, we know that the setting is where Paul is in prison in Rome. And the church of Philippi has sent him a monetary gift, a support to help him. And in the letter that we can read that Paul implies that when he was at Philippi pastoring the church, they shared some very intimate times. It was special to them. And while he recalls fondly, these are words of gratitude. And based on the clues Paul is dropping in the passage, we are able to profile the church of Philippi, though young, is spiritually reviving and it's thriving and bearing spiritual fruit. So what are some clues from the passage we read? Well, for one, the church has a love and affection for their pastor. Two, they're generous, the giving of monies. And we know later that the church not only gave to Paul, but they also gave to others. Third, they're on mission. And we read that Paul says, thank you for defending the gospel. And so we read in this really short passage, the joy that Paul is teeming with, and it's really contagious. Jean Peterson paraphrases this passage, and he says, the dance of words and the exclamation of delight have a way of getting inside us. Eugene Peterson is really talking about Paul's joy as he opens up this letter. And so my question for us today is, how do we, as different house churches, spark joy? How do we become people of joy and of prayer? Well, recently, the runaway success of a Korean TV series on Netflix has everybody talking. And the story weaves gore and violence with children's games. And in every episode, one player dies. And what is disturbing is, even in Christian school playgrounds, elementary school kids are reenacting these games. And my question is, how do these kids in Christian homes have access And that leads me to think that often Christians and non-Christians go to the same source for happiness, for joy. But what sparks joy for Paul should also spark joy for us. What Paul pursues to be joyful should be the same for us. It should be our pursuit as well. Paul's own joy despite being chained in prison should become a model and a pattern for us to follow. And in this really short passage, there are three things that we can learn from our teacher. Number one, as, as Paul began this message, every time you cross my mind, I break out an exclamation of thanks to God. And every exclamation triggers prayer. That, that is how Eugene Peterson paraphrases it in the message. Well, every time that there is joy, let it lead to prayer. And may you bring everything that is joyful, that is happy, may you bring that to God and bring it in prayer. 
That's one. Number two, Paul says, let's trust the Lord Jesus to see everything to completion when he returns. What does that really say? That we're all work in progress, including our spouses, our kids. It's not going to be perfect. We can leave it as imperfect. And our churches will remain flawed. Our people will remain flawed because we are work in progress. So let's trust God with us. And lastly, love each other deeply in pursuit of holiness, that there is a reason to love and how we love and what we love. And love is really a means to an end. And the end is a pursuit of holiness. That your love will not be measured by how much, but it will be measured by how well. So let us love and let that love spill in excess, overflowing for holiness sake. And so to conclude that if you were a church in a letter that all churches in future generations will read, what would that epistle read like? Will it be one of joy? I certainly hope so.